So today we're going to be discussing this unnamed prophet of 1 Kings 13. There are actually two prophets involved within this single chapter. A lot of people don't know anything about this event in particular, or these events in which we're going to go over, but they're very fascinating to learn. Now, I'm certain that most of you have heard of the prophet Elijah and Mount Carmel calling fire down from heaven and such. Well, about 50 years or over 50 years before Elijah came onto the scene in northern Israel, God had sent this unnamed prophet in order to give one of the most fascinating prophecies unto this northern kingdom. But before we get started, let's set this up because this is imperative to know. The very first king over Israel was King Saul. Then came King David. Then came his son, Solomon. Now, as you all remember, Solomon, he had 700 wives, 300 concubines, he had so many of these pagan women that he married that he became corrupt towards the end of his life. We do believe that he repented uh, right before his death, but he had built up this idolatry within Israel that King David certainly, his father, never would have tolerated. But Solomon, because he fell into this idolatry, God took away ten tribes from him, and the kingdom of Israel split into two. After Solomon's death, did ten tribes tell his son, Rehoboam, they said, look, if you lower the labor and the taxes that you're placing upon the people, if you treat us a little bit better than your father, then will we serve under the Davidic line even more so? But Rehoboam, he messed up. He took bad counsel and he said, no, I'm going to impose even more labor upon you. And that caused ten of the tribes to migrate north and they said, we'll have no part of David. So that left Rehoboam to rule over the two tribes, which was Judah and Benjamin in the south. And the ten tribes, they put Jeroboam, one of their beloved fellow laborers, they put Jeroboam as king over them. Now, just a few days into King Jeroboam's rule, did he say to himself, now, wait a minute, one of the feast days is coming up. And God commanded all of Israel to unite in Jerusalem during those feast days in Solomon's temple to worship the true God. And he said, but if my people go down south and into Jerusalem, then they're going to reunite and then they'll kill me and join again with Rehoboam. So what he did was he said, aha, I got a plan. I'm going to set up these two churches one to the south in Bethel, the other to the north in Dan. And instead of the Ark of the Covenant located within Solomon's temple, he said, I'll replace that with two golden calves, one at Bethel, the other at Dan. And these calves will represent the true God of heaven. And this would be the perpetual sin of the northern tribes going to these idols instead of to the true God. But it's on one of the very first church days that Jeroboam sets up that 1 Kings 13 begins. 1 Kings 13, 1, And behold, there came a man of God out of Judah by the word of the Lord unto Bethel. And Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. And he cried against the altar in the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus saith the Lord, Behold, a child shall be born unto the house of David in Judah. There be a king of Judah set up, Josiah by name. Now, this is remarkable because this would not occur until 300 years later, but he's prophesying at this time. And upon thee, upon this altar, shall he offer the priest of the high places that burn incense upon thee, and men's bones shall be burnt upon thee, polluting the place. And he gave a sign the same day, saying, This is the sign which the Lord hath spoken. Behold, the altar shall be rent, and the ashes that are upon it shall be poured out. He's saying so that you know that this prophecy will come to pass, that these are the immediate signs that the Lord will give. And sure enough, this does come to pass. And it came to pass when King Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God, which had cried against the altar in Bethel, that he put forth his hand from the altar, saying, Lay hold on him. And his hand, which he put forth against him, dried up so that he could not pull it in again to him.
The altar also was rent, and the ashes poured out from the altar, according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord, meaning that the altar somehow was torn, it chipped in some way. And the king answered and said unto the man of God, Entreat now the face of the Lord thy God, and pray for me, that my hand may be restored me again. And the man of God besought the Lord, and the king's hand was restored him again, and it became as it was before. Isn't it kind of amazing how Jeroboam, he's right there in front of his God, in which he believed to represent the God of heaven and everything, but suddenly he realizes, okay, this is truly just an object, an idol. And then he says, so entreat, O prophet, the Lord thy God for me. Why not call out to this golden calf? But there are several reasons noted by certain Bible commentators like Matthew Poole as to why God inflicted this punishment immediately upon King Jeroboam because the Lord, he sees the future and he knows that these two calves will cause this nation to eventually fall over 200 years later. But what was the reason for this immediate strike upon Jeroboam? Partly to assure him that the stroke was from God, partly because he repented of that violence which he intended against the prophet for which God inflicted it, and partly that the goodness of God to him might have led him to repentance. You see, God will often inflict people with pain. Then whenever they're healed, they'll either give praise to God or they'll continue in their sins, which Jeroboam chooses the latter. Unto which, if they continue in their sins, being impenitent, it leaves them without excuse. They cannot say, well, Lord, you never did try to correct me. Well, as you see right here, the Lord did publicly. So the prophet prayed for the king, and the king's arm was healed immediately. Verse 7, And the king said unto the man of God, Come home with me, and refresh thyself, and I will give thee a reward. And the man of God said unto the king, If thou wilt give me half thine house, I will not go in with thee, neither will I eat bread nor drink water in this place. For so was it charged me by the word of the Lord, saying, Eat no bread, nor drink water, nor turn again by the same way that thou camest. So this is very important, because this is the command that the Lord gives. Don't eat with anyone, don't drink with anyone there, just go deliver this prophecy, and then come back, not by the way that you entered into Bethel, but come back by another way, immediately back down to Judah. So he went another way and returned not by the way that he came to Bethel. Now you may be wondering as to the reasons behind the Lord saying, don't eat nor drink, just hurry right on back. Well, we're about to come to that, but I do like John Gill's comment at this point. The prohibition not to eat or drink in Bethel was because all the people had become apostates from the true religion, and the reason he was not allowed to return the same way was lest he should be recognized by any whom he had seen in going. They might actually try to take him and cause violence. So the prophet's on his way back down to Judah, and then verse 11 continues this narrative. Now there dwelt an old prophet in Bethel. And his sons came and told him all the works that the man of God had done that day in Bethel, the words which he had spoken unto the king, them they told also to their father. And their father said unto them, What way went he? For his sons had seen what way the man of God went, which came from Judah. And he said unto his sons, Saddle me the ass. So they saddled him the ass, and he rode thereon, and went after the man of God, and found him sitting under an oak. And he said unto him, Art thou the man of God that camest from Judah? And he said, I am. Then he said unto him, Come home with me and eat bread. And he said, I may not return with thee, nor go in with thee, neither will I eat bread, nor drink water with thee in this place. For it was said to me by the word of the Lord, Thou shalt eat no bread, nor drink water there, nor turn again to go by the way that thou camest. He said unto him, I am a prophet also, as thou art. And an angel spake unto me by the word of the Lord, saying, Bring him back with thee into thine house, that he may eat bread and drink water. But he lied unto him. So this old prophet is lying to this one. Now once again, you may be wondering to yourself, Why is this old prophet, if he's truly a prophet, if he's truly a man of God, why is he lying to this younger prophet? Well, certain there's all types of theories about this. Maybe he's a backslidden prophet because he's not far from Bethel, obviously. Some commentators believe that maybe his sons were partaking in the worship of this golden calf and such. All types of different theories. Commentators vary in their reasoning for this old prophet's deception. Clark believed, Adam Clark, believed he only desired more information from the man 
Jameson Fawcett Brown, though, noted that the old prophet desired favor from King Jeroboam, thus lured the man of God into disobedience, or perhaps the sole purpose was simply to test this prophet. But verse 19 continues, So the prophet goes back and did eat bread in his house and drank water. And it came to pass as they sat at the table that the word of the Lord came unto the prophet, the old prophet, that brought him back. And he cried unto the man of God that came from Judah, saying, Thus saith the Lord, For as much as thou hast disobeyed the mouth of the Lord, and hast not kept the commandment which the Lord thy God commanded thee, but camest back, and hast eaten bread, and drunk water in the place, of which the Lord did say to thee, Eat no bread, and drink no water, thy carcass shall not come into the sepulcher of thy fathers. Now this has tons of different implications. Just as Cambridge noted at this point, to be buried by the side of one's ancestors showed that all care has been bestowed upon the corpse. They died in a place that was probably somewhat pleasant to them among family. In the present instance, the deprivation of such burial is equivalent to death in some unusual way and at a distance from home, you're uncomfortable, maybe torture, maybe terror fell upon you suddenly, and so all types of implications. Verse 23 then continues, And it came to pass, after he had eaten bread and after he had drunk, that he saddled for him the ass to wit for the prophet whom he had brought back. And when he was gone, a lion met him by the way and slew him. And his carcass was cast in the way, and the ass stood by it. The lion also stood by the carcass. Now the reason for the mentioning of that last part is because you would think that the ass would run away, the lion would eat him, or at least chase after the ass, but this was so unusual of an instance. No, they both just stay by the carcass. And behold, men passed by and saw the carcass cast in the way, and the lion standing by the carcass. And they came and towed it in the city where the old prophet dwelt. Jameson Fawcett Brown noted at this point, there was a wood near Bethel infested with lions. This sad catastrophe was a severe but necessary judgment of God to attest the truth of the message with which the prophet had been charged. Remember, this is setting an example for all the other prophets that, that would come after him, for Elijah, for Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, all of these that would come afterwards. They would remember this very first of these prophets to pronounce judgment upon this idolatrous nation. All the circumstances of this tragic occurrence, the undevoured carcass, the untouched ass, the passengers unharmed by the lion, those standing there, were calculated to produce an irresistible impression that the hand of God was in it. And when the prophet that brought him back from the way heard thereof, he said, It is the man of God who was disobedient unto the word of the Lord. Therefore the Lord hath delivered him unto the lion, which hath torn him and slain him, according to the word of the Lord which he spake unto him. Charles Ellicott noted on this old prophet's response, There is in his words a characteristic reticence as to his own share in the work, in respect both of the deceit and the prediction of judgment, perhaps indicating something of the strange mixture of remorse and unscrupulous policy which comes out in his later action. Some might feel a bit confused at the prophet's fate after a so seemingly small matter, but let us consider the circumstances carefully. God told the prophet to return to Judah after pronouncing judgment upon the idolatrous nation of Israel. He was to neither eat, drink, or go into any person's house. It is true that the prophet disobeyed God's command, but isn't it possible, isn't this just one of the possibilities, but isn't it possible that God told the man to go back in haste because his life would be at risk otherwise? Could this not be a symbolic showing to all of us in whom love the Lord to remain obedient? Scripture tells us that Satan skulks about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Such a man of God would have certainly been targeted after such a daring event as that at Bethel. Point being, as to this being just one of the many theories involved right here, no doubt it was a punishment from God, but there's also this other theory that could have taken place. Point being, God may have been preserving the man's life by ordering him to not delay in the land. One should therefore not be so quick to view God in any other light than just in his commands. Perhaps God knowing that this line was going to be at that place at that particular time, maybe God was telling him, don't delay. Don't do this that you're going to do. Don't stop. Just get right back into Judah and you'll be safe. There are several different ways to look at this. No doubt if the man had obeyed God, 
then he would have completely avoided this lying and everything else. Matthew Henry wrote, Believers are most in danger of being drawn from their duty by plausible pretenses of holiness. No doubt, so many more will go to hell if they believe that what they're doing is in right relation with God, because no one wants to be, or hardly anyone wants to be, outright evil. That's why there are so few Satanists and so many religious people. God is displeased at the sins of his own people, and no man shall be protected in disobedience by his office, his nearness to God, or any services he has done for him. God warns all whom he employs strictly to observe their orders. However, we cannot judge of men by their sufferings, nor of their sins by present punishments. Just like in Job, they believe Job was a horrible sinner because he had so many afflictions being cast upon him. With some, the flesh is destroyed that the spirit may be saved. With others, the flesh is pampered that the soul may be ripened for hell. Verse 27 continues the narrative. And the old prophet spake to his son, saying, Saddle me the ass. And they saddled him. And he went and found his carcass cast in the way, and the ass and the lion standing by the carcass. The lion had not eaten the carcass, nor torn the ass. And the prophet took up the carcass of the man of God, and laid it upon the ass, and brought it back. And the old prophet came to the city to mourn and to bury him. And he laid his carcass in his own grave, and they mourned over him, saying, Alas, my brother. And it came to pass, after he had buried him, that he spake to his sons, saying, When I am dead, then bury me in the sepulcher, wherein the man of God is buried. Lay my bones beside his bones. For the saying which he cried by the word of the Lord against the altar in Bethel, and against all the houses of the high places which are in the cities of Samaria, shall surely come to pass. 2 Kings 23 then picks up with the reign of Josiah many, many, many years afterwards. Moreover, the altar that was at Bethel, the very same altar, and the high place which Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin by making these two golden calves, both that altar and the high place Josiah break down and burned the high place and stamped it small to powder and burned the grove. And as Josiah turned himself, he spied the sepulchers that were there in the mount and sent and took the bones out of the sepulchers and burned them upon the altar and polluted it, according to the word of the Lord, which the man of God proclaimed three hundred years before, who proclaimed these words. Then King Josiah said, What title is that that I see? And the men of the city told him, It is the sepulcher of the man of God, which came from Judah, and proclaim these things that thou hast done against the altar of Bethel. And he said, Let him alone, let no man move his bones. So they led his bones alone with the bones of the prophet that came out of Samaria.